Hello and give, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, teaching session organized jointly by the FRCS Mentor Group and Orthopedic Research UK. The speaker this evening is Mr. Peter Bates. He's a consultant, trauma and orthopedic surgeon at the Royal London Hospital. Mr. Bates is a trauma surgeon. He's head of the trauma at the Royal London Hospital, one of the busiest um, uh, major trauma centers in the UK. His subspecialty interest is polytrauma, and in particular, a treatment of pelvic and acetabular fractures. He is a lead faculty of multiple um, postgraduate courses, uh, including MSc in trauma, um, orthopedic trauma sciences, and um, uh, also trauma sciences online teaching, distant teaching programs. Peter has trained in London. And he did the fellowships around the world. He went um, in London to Stanmore, and he spent um, a long time in New Zealand, in Nottingham, and in the U USA training in trauma. So a lot of experience uh, in trauma as well as in teaching. So we are very pleased to have him uh, tonight with us. I'm certain that all of us will learn a lot from him tonight. Myself, I'm Firas Arnaud, and I'll be modulating today, and with me, uh, other mentors from the FRCS Mentor Group, uh, um, we have Nikki Evans, Haniel Pardisi, uh, Fuad Chowdhury, uh, Muhammad Imam. So they will all be helping um, us to run the session and to run the feedback. This session uh, cannot happen without the help of ORUK, and we have Ruth, the Head of Education, as well as uh, Hannah. Ruth will be the co-host, and she will help us organize the teaching tonight and she will um, uh, sort out your certificates and request you to fill feedback afterwards. So the session, as you see, there will be a, a short presentation um, at FRCS level for the exam. Uh, this will be followed by three MCQ questions. So, so please uh, stay focused all the time um, the, uh, to answer these questions correctly. Then we will invite you, we're, you're always invited to ask questions throughout, and we will filter this question through and, uh, to Mr. Bates. So please uh, um, write your uh, questions in the chat box. Following this uh, presentation, there will be case discussion, and we will uh, ask uh, some of you to take part in this. And the following, this will be followed afterwards by Viva uh, practice, hot seat Viva practice session. And um, we have places for six candidates. The, so those who want to take part, please express your interest as early as you can. Raise the hand symbol next to your name or express your interest in the chat box and we will book you. We're sorry we have only six places. So um, please let us know as soon as you can. So we, we, as I said, we just maintain it. We try to keep it interactive. So encourage you to ask any questions you have. Every question is a good question. And we have all been through this process of exam preparation. We know Viva practice could feel intimidating, but be assured that you are, uh, we all need a new situation. We all support you and understand how you feel. And if you miss any part of the presentation, don't worry, it will be on the uh, YouTube channel of the FRCS Mentor Group, as well as on ORUK um, uh, website uh, within a few days. So without further ado, I'll leave you with uh, Mr. Bates. Hey guys, uh, uh, this is a well attended session. Thank you so much for coming in. I'm, I'm honored to be invited. Thank you for ORUK and to the FRCS group. It's, it's, it really is, you know, it's a real honor to come to these things and speak to you guys and be invited by such influential people to, uh, to these things. So thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm talking about polytrauma. Polytrauma is one of those difficult things because uh, in most surgical rotations, most orthopedic rotations, you don't get to see much polytrauma unless you sit for a, a length of time in a major trauma center. But even if you're in a major trauma center for just six months, you don't necessarily see that much polytrauma in terms of you managing it, if you see what I mean. So you might see it at the trauma meeting, but you don't necessarily like feel it in, you're in the midst of it, you kind of thing. So I, I think it's still something that, that particularly amongst trainees, there's, there's quite a lot of misunderstanding and it's, you're not quite sure what you, know, what you should be thinking and things like that. So, um, and the thought processes are complicated. 
it's quite high testosterone polytrauma, particularly when you're in the ED bay. And so there's, there's a lot of like expressed emotion. It's quite like stressful. And so clear thinking is sometimes difficult in the heat of battle, if you know what I mean. Okay, polytrauma. Orthopedic, this is about orthopedic decision making, really. This is, polytrauma generally starts in the ED bay with a lot of people doing stuff and um and you as the orthopedic surgeon are like standing back maybe or maybe you're in the thick of it maybe you're putting a chest training or maybe you're taking some blood or whatever it is you're doing you're secretly thinking what on earth am i going to do with his orthopedic injuries you don't even know what all the injuries are, are yet you've been told he's got a wobbly leg and his foot's hanging off and he's got a wrist fracture and it looks like he's got some ribs or something and he's, it's been a bad injury but that's kind of all you know and every, no one else gives a crap about the about about the fractures everyone else is worried about a b and c uh or they're worried about what the gas is or what when's the next slot in ct and things like that and, but actually what you're thinking about is what am I going to do with his orthopedic injuries? And of course, we have this additional sense, don't we, of your spectrum of physiological status with stable being at this end and extremist being at this end and like borderline people or unstable people somewhere in the middle. And obviously these guys at this end, at the extremist end, get, uh, damage, get, get damage control, and the people at the stable end get early total care. And what could be more simple than that? And that's a really elegant, very orthopedic kind of way of thinking about people, about these cases. And in the middle somewhere you've got borderline and unstable, and we'll talk about those later, okay? So, of course, on one side you've got, you've got damage control. What is damage control? Um, we all know what the, where, where it came from. It's a military term. It's about sinking of ships and all of that. Um, uh, but in orthopedics, it's basically uh, not doing big interventional stuff. It's about putting on external fixators or putting people in traction and not doing nailing of femur or nailing of tibia or like five hour operation. That's what damage control is in the orthopedic setting. Um, and very odd this it kind of um, keeps clicking off and it all came about from Giannoudis. Giannoudis and Pape back in the noughties and nineties came up with this uh, this kind of graph which you're all everyone watching this video this this thing will be will recognize this guy yeah and you'll all know about the second hit um, the inflammatory response after trauma the second hit phenomenon and um, and basically, you, after a trauma, you, you have a little inflammatory response and then it kind of dies off afterwards. Uh, but if you do a big operation around this point here, what happens instead, you, sorry, instead you end up with this like bigger curve going over the top and everyone has, every one of us has a predetermined genetic threshold for developing SIRS. And so uh, you end up, uh, and if you exceed that threshold, you go on to develop ARDS or SIRS or, or whatever it is, uh, um, of, uh, you know, or, or, you know, goes by many names, multi-organ dysfunction. There are many names for it. It's basically an immunological response to trauma, which uh, makes you very, very unwell. Okay. So, and that was all pretty well understood as well. And it was backed up at the time. So I, I'm struggling with my transitions a bit. It was backed up at the time with a bunch of papers. This wasn't made up. This wasn't Genu's making up. There were a whole bunch of papers that were listed down there. And uh, if you look at the dates on them, they're all around the 80s and 90s. So these, these were, this was a common problem. Patient comes in, very, very banged up. You resuscitate them, you nail their femur, and then they just die. And that, that definitely, definitely happened. Um, and so they coined this phrase of damage or control orthopedics because it's better to be safe than sorry. Yeah. So rather than like nail their femur and they die, why don't we do something like an intermediate thing, which is less impacting, and then wave them to get a bit better and then nail their femur. Yeah. And that was the theory. And you used to say, we've got to wait three days or wait five days, or wait how many days it was in your head, and then we can go ahead and nail their femur. That was the traditional teaching. Uh, and that, that got a huge amount of traction for about 10 years or so. Um, I don't get this, it's bizarre. Um, and that's what DCO generally looks like. 
Um, it looks like an X fix of some sort. It may be skeletal traction. Um, but at the same time, at the same time as all of that, there were other studies around, look at them, around the same time, around the same era that were basically saying, not the opposite, but basically saying that if you take all patients and you nail all of those early within 24 hours, yeah, you get a femoral nail into them early within 24 hours, you have reduced ALDS, reduced facet embolism syndrome, length of ICG, all the rest, all that good stuff. So nailing early is great. And yet there are some people who just die and it's clearly the femoral nail that killed them. So how do we, how do we level that? And then Valier came along. This is like, this is like 20 years later. Yeah, Valier came, and, th and these are the famous articles. And if you're doing the, the, the exam, these are the ones to, to focus on. And if you're gonna focus on one of them, it will be that 2015 article, which is kind of the most recent. I'm gonna walk you through them. She coined, she's a trauma surgeon in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, she basically, she's a bit of a like, a, you know, she's a proper, uh, you know, stats, you know, she's, she's a good, she's a, she's a database uh, person, basically looking at huge databases and trying to make sense of them. And she looked at their trauma database and, um, in, uh, and she coined the term early appropriate care. And that's the phrase for the exam, early appropriate care. It started off here because in JOT in 2010, she did a retrospective review of a massive trauma database, 645 patients, and what she worked out, because up until then, everyone had been fixated on femur fractures. It's all about nailing the femur. You know, it's nailing the femur now, good, or nailing then. But it was all about the femur. But she was the first person to say, actually, maybe it's a bit more than a femur. Maybe pelvis and acid tabulum are in this as well. So she looked at that, and she showed exactly the same thing as Larry Bone and all those other guys had shown 20 years previously, that not only is fixing the femur in the first 24 hours good, fixing the pelvis and acid tabulum in the first 24 hours is also good in terms of your outcomes corrected for iss and age so his pelvis and acetabulum is suddenly in the mix as well then she mixed it up even further like two, three years later she produced this one bigger cohort of patients still retrospective bigger cohort of patients all of them iss over 18 but corrected for iss so so they're kind of uh, and for age so that so that they're equivalent groups um now it was pelvis and, and spine fractures, femur, pelvis, and spine fractures, what people have come to talk about axial fractures, like spine, that's, that's not neck, that's kind of thoracolumbar, and pelvis and femur. And again, same thing, definitive treatment, 24 hours, clearly better when corrected for ISIS at an age. So you could argue, uh, well, maybe it's the sick patients who were the worst and, and they're the ones that didn't get it, and, but they still did badly. And that, that just hasn't, that, that hasn't borne out of the data. That's one of the obvious criticisms, but actually that hasn't uh, borne out of the data. Another one, same year, much bigger series, 1,400 patients, all retrospective still. Um, again, femur, pelvis, and spine. This time she's changed the figure though. It's now 48 hours. Again, proved the same thing. This is when she starts talking about lactate, lactate less than four within eight hours. This, and, so, and so start. we're starting to talk about lactate a bit more and we're trying to get, get it and that's within eight hours. So if you can get the lactate down by below four within eight hours, then they do, be then they do better with early treatment. But only if you can get it down within eight hours, yeah? So people who take ages to resuscitate, they're not in this algorithm. What about chest injuries? Traditionally, we've all been obsessed about chest injuries. So if you have a, um, a bad chest, so you're, you're, you've got bilateral femur fractures, but you've also got a bad chest. Now what? What does the chest do? Because traditionally we said, oh, bad chest. Oh yeah, that makes them more susceptible to, th to things. We better do damage control. But actually what she showed was that yes, if you have a bad chest injury, yes, you do have more pulmonary complications down the line and more a ARDS as well. But, Damage control didn't improve that. Early surgery still had fewer complications, even if you had a bad chest injury. So, so chest injury is kind of out of the mix now. 2015, this is probably the article that most people are quoting nowadays. This is her most recent uh, uh, foray into this uh, because it's, it's smaller numbers you'll notice, but it's prospective. 
She's basically taken her algorithm and now, now it's going forwards rather than backwards. She's run it prospectively and see, see what, what, what goes on. This is the one that everyone was basically waiting for, to, to, for her to test her own algorithm prospectively. And definitive treatment is 36 hours of injury, provided the lactate is less than four, uh, within eight hours, same thing. So she's, she's and basically it's, it's half the complication rate, half the complication rate if you manage to get them done. What you might be argue, asking your head, why didn't she get more than the, why weren't half of them, uh, why weren't uh, the group who didn't get surgery in that time, why didn't they get the surgery? And the answer is, she, she, she always, I've seen, I've seen her answer this question. She says, it's just because the, either there wasn't time or the surgeons chose not to do that. For example, maybe they said, I'll wait till morning or we'll, uh, I'll do that tomorrow on my list or something along those lines. The surgeons chose not to do that um, it was the reason usually. Um, so those are the articles that I would be quoting if I was taking the exam. The 2015 one is the one that's the most, uh, that's the most, uh, most commonly quoted. However, and this is important too, if you're really going to ace this one, it's important to say that not everyone loves Valier's work. Not everyone loves it. And Pape, because Pape and Junudis were like, you know, doing their stuff together. And Pape is really unimpressed. He's a German guy, works out of Hanover. Uh, super famous, quite an old guy, but super famous on the trauma side. He is not bought into this at all. And he thinks this is a real step backwards. Uh, and he's still, oh, sorry, 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 uh, very much into the trauma scene. He feels her model, which is based on lactate and a little bit on pH, is way too simplistic just to use acid base. And he feels that she's also overplayed the downsides of damage control. He feels that, you know, damage control is done well, X fixes, etc., done well, actually the morbidity is very low. And that's something he puts very strongly in his article. And it, one thing is true. And now guys, it's really important you understand this. So I am a follower of the much more of the uh, Valier school of thought than I am of the Pape. But one thing is definitely true. Lactate is good for that ED setting, that early, like early first 24 hours. Once you're out of the 24 hour setting, lactate becomes just one number in a much bigger picture of temperature, clotting, sepsis, uh, uh, ICP. Um, there are loads of factors all coming in, all playing into it. Blood pressure, how responsive you are to fluids, etc., etc. So once you're into ITU, lactate becomes a bit much less of a, a sharp tool and so it's it's wrong to use lactate to flow through like for 48 hours and so to, to keep going and going and going with lactate all right and that's why valier says you've got to get the lactate down below four within eight hours because after that 8 12 24 hour mark lactate is is, is less useful as a, as, a, as a predictor. And that's important. If you're gonna really nail this topic, that's an important thing to come out. All right. Um, sorry, struggling with this a bit. Um, X-Fix, particularly for a femur, is not a free lunch. And I think that's also a, a th an important thing to understand. Um, uh, it prolongs your surgical episode considerably. Uh, slows down your rehab and uh, you, you know there are lots of things that that x fixes don't do particularly well it also impacts your definitive treatment so you can have x fix pin site infections or poor reduction uh you know uh, uh you know keeping the legs short for too long period and then making the femoral nail harder it often makes your femoral nail a more difficult femoral nail rather than an easy one unless it's been absolutely anatomically reduced and none of the pin sites pass out so damage control is not benign. I'm not saying it's terrible, but it's not benign. Uh, and so that idea of damage control is the safe option. So why don't we just do something safe? Because that nailing the female, although it can work out really well, can be very hazardous. That's, that's also, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's got to be a nuanced, balanced argument there. There is something other than X fix. You can do traction. So this has been looked at. It's, again, it's a while ago now. Bossy's group uh, from uh, he was in North Carolina then, I think, um, looked at uh, uh, something other than it. So they looked at uh, um, traction instead of X fix. So they looked at sleep traction versus X fix in the initial temporization of femoral shaft fractures. Weirdly, actually, their study, although it wasn't significant, it showed a slight advantage to, to traction over X fix. So uh, because it had lower complication rates. So. Uh, I think most people now are thinking that damage control can look like uh, skeletal traction. 
So that's, that's damage control. I want to just take you down. What about this borderline business? What about this middle ground? What's going on there? Because you've got early total care on one side, damage control on the other. And so what, what, what pushes you towards, towards damage control? And traditionally, uh, we've looked at a number of things. Uh, just ignoring lactate for a second. You know, abnormal parameters, pulse, pH, that kind of thing. Bilateral femur fractures was always something traditionally that we were, oh, well, that's, that's, that's dangerous. They, you know, the patient might die. Thoracic trauma, chest injuries, high ISS. Sorry. High ISS, geriatric trauma, high ICP, open fractures. There was always, and you can see that after a while, I mean, every multi, multi trauma patient almost always has one or two of those things. So there's a danger. If you take too much notice of these, like these kind of tagline, like all bilateral femur fractures, there's a danger of your of DCO become default option. You go, well, we'll just do default because they've got a, a, a very low pH or because they've got a high ACP or because, you see what I mean? Um, but the thing that has changed is this, resuscitation is not what it was. Remember I showed you those articles, they're all back in the 1980s and 90s. At that point, this is what, this is what, oh man, this is what resuscitation used to look like. It was basically a bit of blood if you're lucky, but mainly it was normal saline or ringer's lactate. That was the, the crux of, of um, you know, that was the, the sort of the nuts and bolts of resuscitation. It was all about restoring volume. It was all about you know, bring, bring this volume up, more saline, more saline. And actually, nowadays, it's totally different. Modern resuscitation is much more about, um, is much more about uh, restoring clotting. We've got binders, we've got uh, massive transfusion protocols, we're giving tranexamic acid early, we're doing rotems to sort out people's clots. Uh, we are uh, aiming for a system. We're not bringing systolic blood, blood pressure up too rapidly because uh, we might blow off a clot. Early CT. CT is right next door to the to the resus bay. We've got these that thing in the bottom right. You see is is a, is a level one transducer or a Belmont machine. These are things which can pump huge volumes of fluid into a patient very very quickly. Um, you know, and, and so actually, it, which gives you a lot of confidence, for example, to go to the CT scanner, because now you know that even if they crash, you can still pump blood in very quickly. Blood products, not just blood, but, but you know, FFP, cryo, and, and, and platelets. And in the middle there is a protocol. Life is so much more protocol nowadays. Modern resuscitation, there's not a huge amount that, like, of cerebral thinking that goes in because everybody knows what comes next. It's a, it's a not automaton process, but modern resuscitation is heavily protocolized. And it's much, sorry, it is much more, and there's also a lot of expertise because we've centralized it in, in resuscitation, uh, in, in MTCs. So, in the past, it was all about filling people up. Nowadays, it's much more about restoring clotting, turning off the tap, restoring physiology, reducing acidosis. Radically different, di different uh, way of resuscitating people nowadays. So if I take you back to this, this, this graph of Giannoudis, you've got your second hit of surgery, but what people didn't really describe at this time was doing a second hit when the patient is not fully resuscitated. That's a really important point. Doing a big operation on someone who is not fully resuscitated is highly immunogenic. That really gets your immune system pissed because uh, you're, basically the, the immune system is trying to get its, its head around being hypotensive and then you're doing something to it which makes it even more hypotensive. And that is what can bring about your SIRS. The theory goes if you if you rehabilitate if you resuscitate people effectively that's the bringing down the lactate thing you make them able to uh, tolerate that second hit and and uh, this comes back you know this this is actually not a new concept so blows the first person who talked about lactate had 50 versus 20 percent complication rate if the ISS was uh, uh, sorry, if their lactate was less than 2.5 at the time of nailing, they did very much better. In fact, you know, the complication rate was more than halved. So the idea of lactate being a predictor in, the, in this 24-hour period is nothing new. 
uh, O'Toole in Baltimore, they had a traffic light system where they talked about 25. And now you've got Valier talking about less than four and eight hours. This is what, where lactate comes from. It's just that in the first 24 hours, it is a useful indicator. And multiple different authors have shown that in a different way. So when, you, when you're resuscitating, so when you go back to this diagram, it's all about resuscitating people from their extremist state to their stable state. That's the, that's the problem with this diagram, is that you're, you're assuming that it's a static thing, but it's not as a dynamic picture. You're taking someone who's an extremist, you're resuscitating them such that they're now a stable patient, and now they should be good for early total care. All right, that is what has changed. It's really resuscitation that has changed the gig here. Um, what is early retail care? This is a definition given by Chris Moran about five years ago. So this is fairly recent, but not that recent. Definitive fixation, all long, bo long bones within 24 hours of injury, once the patient is physiologically stable. He wrote that about the same time as O'Toole came out with his, his thing in 2000, uh, uh, in, in uh, yeah, around about 2007. No, this is, yeah, it's about, anyway, this was in response to O'Toole's paper, talking about the traffic light system. Long bone fractures. What is a long bone fracture? What is a long bone fracture? It's a good question, isn't it? I mean, it's not a mess. Um, that's not a long bone, right? Okay. Uh, but a femur, let's call that, that is a long bone. Forearm, is that a long bone? Well, they are quite long. You know, they're almost as, my, my forearm's probably longer than some girl's femurs. But anyway, no one's pretending that a forearm fracture is actually like systemically upsetting you. Uh, humerus is a totally a long bone, right? That's way longer than, a, than you know, some, you know, I, 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 a, long, a humerus is a long bone, but it's not, doesn't count in this setting. So we don't see, see people putting on damage control X fixes on people's humeruses, do we? Um, what about tibia? That's a long bone, right? And yet, is it? No one has ever demonstrated, no one has ever proven that nailing someone's tibia early gives you a better outcome or reduces your level of ARDS or SIRS or, or MODS or, or, or whatever, yeah? So actually, tibia doesn't really fit the bill for a long bone either, weirdly. So what is a long bone? I mean, if Valier is to believe, long bone is pelvis, spine, and femur. So this term long bone, you've got to try and get that out of your head. In an exam setting, I would not be talking about long bone injuries because nowadays the systemically upsetting injuries are pelvis or axial injuries, pelvis spinal femur. And so early appropriate care is fixation of pelvis spinal femur. Oh, there's one more as well. One more potential one, which is yet is unproven. And that's this one, the chest injury. Where does chest injury in that sit in that? We don't know yet because we, we've got a randomized controlled trial, uh, one that has concluded in, in Canada recently, which was, which was equivocal. We've got the ORIF trial, which we're in the middle of right now, which is the UK version of that, a randomized controlled trial looking at fix versus no fix of rib fractures. We don't know whether fixing people's rib fractures improves quality, improves outcome, but it may turn out to be that that's yet another axial fracture and could be added to that list. But at the moment, it is femur, pelvis, and spine uh, as, the, as the things to go for early. And I'll take you back to this. What about this identifying the borderline patient? Well, okay, let's look at those. Let's look at those. Abnormal parameters, pulse, pH, lactate. Those are all correctable. Remember, it's 36 hours. You could do a lot in 36 hours. You could really resuscitate the hell out of someone in 36 hours. You put their femur on traction and you just wait until, and you just, you know, wait until they're, wait until they're ready. So those are correctable items. Uh, open fractures, thoracic trauma, actually, if anything, that increases the urgency. We need to get them to quickly before we develop complications from those, from those other things. Uh, high ISS, geriatric form trauma same principles if you can bring the lactate down in within eight hours you're good to go same with bilateral femur fractures fix but cautiously fix now I, i'm being a little bit a little bit aggressive with this because I'm, I'm making out that you know if the lactate's down then you're good to go and you can close your eyes and you can go ahead and nail that femur and that isn't quite true because actually if you've got bilateral femurs you can nail the first one you want to be seeing at that stage how their lactate's going. If the lactate is rising, 
you probably want to stop. So often you can have a bit of early total care or early appropriate care and a little bit of damage control as well. Maybe I'll put that one on traction overnight. High ICP. This is the one that kills us as orthopedics because often the neurosurgeons will not let us go to theater because their, their ICP is high. And so even though their lactate may be low, low, low and always been low, you still can't take them to the theater to nail their femur because that will raise their ICP. So actually in our hospital, the thing that stops us going more often than not is not high lactate, it's high ICP. So to conclude, stable patients, Apologies. Stable patients get early definitive care, and that's fine, and no one's going to argue with that. All of the other three get resuscitation, and the early resuscitation, not the late resuscitation, the early resuscitation is, sits around lactate. And you can be patient. You do not have to dive in tonight. You don't even have to go tomorrow morning unless there's an open fracture, but you, you've got time to let this patient settle before you intervene. Some fractures, some patients will end up, therefore, after you've sorted them out, they may end up into early definitive treatment, in which case you, you, you're still in that great beneficial zone. You prioritize the injuries, so femur, pelvis, spine go first, and then other things go second. What's the appropriate bit then? What is this early appropriate care? And here it is. Number one, no major surgery on unresuscitated patients. That is the killer point. If there's one thing you take from this talk, it is do not be performing major surgery on people who are still under resuscitated. Okay, second point. Cease major surgery if lactate is rising. That's what the appropriate bit is. It's basically saying, yes, you can go and do your, do your thing, but what I don't want you doing is is making this patient worse just because you're blindly doing surgery. Cease major surgery if you're. A... I just I've got it's got a little blue hand there. I thought yes, that was that. Uh, so, don't worry, Peter. That's that's for uh, the viva. Okay, great. Um, uh, I'll repeat that. Appropriate means no major surgery on under resuscitated patients. It also means that if you're doing a bilateral femur on someone, you do one femur and then you look at the lactate and then you say to the anesthetist, if the lactate starts rising during this operation, please tell me and I will stop and I will put skeletal traction on. Okay, that's what early appropriate care is. So in summary, damage control orthopedics is not plan A. X fixes are not benign and nor is skeletal traction for that matter. So resuscitate to allow early appropriate care and you'll get 90% of your patients will end up uh, getting early appropriate care. No major surgery, surgery if lactate is high. Consider traction versus X fix if, uh, if, you're, if you're in that damage control situation. Uh, early appropriate care, definitive treatment of pelvis spine of femur within 36 hours provided your lactate is below four. I have to say, and I think you would all agree, those of you living in the NHS would agree, that is a massive challenge for the NHS to get spine and pelvis and all femurs fixed within uh, 36 hours. It's quite a challenge. Uh, and that's something we, I, I'm making out this is the gold standard. We do not achieve that in our hospital every single time. And I don't want to pretend that we do because it's difficult. You know, we don't really have the resources for that necessarily. All right. That's my talk. I, I think now's a good time for questions and then we can move on to other stuff. Lovely, Peter. Thank you very much. That's, um, thank you for all the energy uh, you've put into this presentation. You emphasized all the important points very nicely. Um, I, I like how you put in this balance between damage control and early total care and have you reached to the early appropriate care afterwards very nicely, smoothly, I think um, very clearly explained to all of us. Um, I was, there have been a lot of questions and you actually answered most of them during your talk. Um, so, so um, but, but one of the questions we had from Rachel, which is a simple but uh, meaningful question really. She's asked, how do you define polytrauma? Is there any, you know, if you, you know, oh. is there any specific definition for it? Do you use any score? Uh, you no, no, and it, it depends which article you read. Some define it as yeah. ISS greater, over greater than eight if you're working in a place that doesn't get much polytrauma, or most people define it as an ISS greater than 15. 
that's usually what you say is someone who is is poly traumatized ISS grade than 15 is like the sort of is that the probably what people most accept but some people draw that line differently yeah um, you know when you're writing a retrospective paper you look at all the ISS's and you think well you can nice add these guys in as well so you kind of stretch it one way or the other to, to, to make your series yeah. bigger but most people would say ISIS greater than 15. I think that's the most commonly quoted. Thank you. And just for Rachel, I think you know what's going to be the next question from the examiner here when you say that. He's going to tell you tell me about the ISS. So be prepared. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. yeah and, 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 uh, okay, so when you're defining ISS, uh, don't get bogged down into a square root of this and the square of that and you're getting all complicated. Don't, don't overcomplicate it. Just to talk about, uh, you know, the... the um, uh, just talk about it simply and schematically rather than trying to like calculate an ISS from a mythical patient. Otherwise you will tie yourself in knots. It's not hundred percent straightforward is the answer. Absolutely. Just keep it simple. And, and from your experience in working in a, uh, a trauma center, is, is a pet embolism with femoral fractures a common uh, thing or? Yeah. Well, it's not, it's not, I wouldn't say it's common. I had one, I had one like uh, last Friday. Exactly that. We, okay. you know, Came to theatre, he had an isolated femur fracture. He, he goes to theatre, young guys, often young men who, who, who experience it. And we nailed his femur, operation went very nicely, wasn't, didn't go on too long. Comes back to the, the, wakes up and he's fine. And then the next day he's just all confused and he's all over the place. And he ends up with, yeah, it turns out he's had a fat embolism. So yes, it definitely is a real thing, definitely. And how about a pre-operative? Pre uh... Uh, uh, fat embolism as a result of the fracture can that um, uh, obviously it can happen but is, is it is it common well we don't see that anymore we just don't yeah. see that anymore because we're so aggressive about getting people to theater as soon yes. as we can so it's very I mean, it does sometimes in the people who are in absolute extremists and they are almost dead when they arrive and so resuscitating them takes much longer than normal and they have a huge like surge response afterwards uh, you know almost immediately afterwards and you 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 basically the lactate never really comes down those those are people who uh, often do develop yeah, ARDS, SIRS, and whatever before you get to them, but they were terribly, terribly sick beforehand. The whole of the rest of the population, we generally get to them before. So fat embolism syndrome and ARDS and these things tend to be post-operative rather than pre-operative. Lovely, because the question was from Rachel, is whether you, um, if you diagnose fat embolism, whether you would nail or plate that patient, but you're saying it's we, you, you like, wait for them to get better you just wait for them to get better and then you do it wait for, wait for them and nail it after yeah and then they go for nailing because that is that is yeah. by far the best operation for a femur fracture yeah lovely and I, I think um um now way, if, yeah. so i'll qualify that if you decided that you wanted to put an x-fix on while you're waiting for that patient to 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 settle down and like get their all their metrics back together and that would be a totally reasonable thing to do so i wouldn't be then plating the femur uh in the hope that so i don't make those fat embolism because you know we all know that plating a femur is a terrible operation because the plate just can't handle it and the plate will break and then the plate comes off and they're going to nailing and all the rest of it so uh you know the nail is still the best operation for a femur fracture um, it's just you, you, uh, so I wouldn't compromise on that. But if you want to put them in an X fix for a week or so while the patient settles and their fat embolism sorts itself out, then that's yeah, go for it. So okay, and you, I, are into, that, you are in damage control situation there, and uh, the early to, early appropriate care thing goes out the window. Yeah, and I think you highlighted how early appropriate care is applicable. Uh, with appropriate after following appropriate resuscitation and and the results have improved with this reconfiguration of the trauma service into into more specialized trauma centers. <clears throat> so this all play part, isn't it, in the outcome? And not, oh, just, not, not, ex expertise is a huge thing. So by, yeah. by 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 bringing all these major injuries into 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 major trauma centers, it's hugely changed the uh, the yeah. outcome. And, and Chris Moran's got some awesome slides of how mortality from major trauma has 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 come down massively since we uh, uh, you know since since, since MTC started uh, back in 2012. You know. When, yeah. when you and I think my advice is because this sort of an exam scenario is is we put that in the answer to show high order of thinking that we've been there in the, in the trauma centers and not just numbers of lactate or 36 or 24 or eight hours. Yeah. 
we show there's other factors that expertise, that resuscitation, the advancement in resuscitation, other things that have to play important part in the outcome, not just yeah. simple numbers. So, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, yeah, that's right. It, the, the ground has shifted from the Giannoudis and Pape days uh, where they were talking about DC was a real, real hot topic of conversation. A, a fundamental thing has happened, and that is that resuscitation has come on massively. And uh, I don't know if that uh, comes into your territory, but uh, there is a question from Sahib. He was asking how exactly the mechanism of fat embolism, they seem to be out of interest in fat embolism tonight. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't think anyone really understands fat embolism. I yeah. think what most people are agreed, it is not a lump of fat going into your brain. Yeah. It is, a, it is I mean, it, it may start with that. It may start with some kind of like, you know, fat in your system. But to suggest that there's more fat in a fat embolism person's system than it is in any, you know, we know that if, if I was to nail your femur right now for us, even an intact femur, and I, and I put a Doppler thing in your heart, I, you would see globs of fat bobbling through your right atrium as I nailed your femur. That, is, that happens to everybody. So everyone gets like a, a bit of a fat, let's call it. Um, yeah. But uh, so, no, so everyone gets the fat, it's your response to the fat. So I think most people are now thinking that fat is, FEZ, ARDS, SIRS, MODS, they are all different manifestations of an immunog immunological response to trauma. Yeah, so it could be, uh, yeah, as you said, it's the, probably, uh, as you said, we don't know exactly uh, the pathophysiology behind this. It could be inflammatory response. Yeah, contributes. Exactly. So it's, 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 I mean, I th it's, it's some kind of, you know, it's massive release of interleukins into your system. So rather than acting in a paracrine level, like, you know, locally yeah. cell, cell, they're acting on a systemic yeah. level, which makes all uh, uh, cells in that area go crazy. And then yeah, you that, that, make, that makes sense. Know, it's not a lump of... Yeah, it's not the lump of fat that has went through that circulation that's and blocked the lungs. Lump yeah, that's stuck in your brain that's causing the problem. It, yeah, that's right. And uh, just one more question: Is is are you waiting for a patient with a um, uh, fat femoral fracture with fat embolism to re to be fit for surgery? Do you put them? Do you give them? Uh, put them in the traction or exfix them? So someone who's had a fat embolism and they're waiting for surgery. Yeah. I think which, is, are, which is rare, isn't it? You said it's rare. I, I, I think it, 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 some people would say dealer's choice. Putting someone on traction for more than two or three days is, is really problematic. I and mean, we've all seen that in our own practice. It's not a great thing. It's very difficult to nurse someone in traction. An X-Fix is a much better solution. If you think that sure. they're going to be better tomorrow, so it's a wait, you're waiting for them to just, just to, uh, come, come fit or you're waiting yeah. for this to crop up, then, then you can put them in traction. But I think if you're expecting like a three or four day wait till surgery, then putting them in an X-Fix is, is a very reasonable thing to do. Lovely. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, we really appreciate your input. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I guess that talk very much feels like I'm dissing the X-Fix and I'm like, God, oh, you don't want to put these X-Fix, they're all terrible. There's definitely a role for X-Fixes. I still put X-Fixes on femurs uh, in very sick patients, but it's usually the very, very extremist people or the people with head injuries or the people, as you say, who um, have had something weird going on, and for some reason, there's going to be a delay to fixing their femur for whatever reason. And I think just for the ex for extra exam purposes, whenever you present it with these questions, guys, it is just say it is a changing situation. We always continuously monitoring the patient condition, intraoperatively, postoperatively. So if you take a decision and you find the patient is not fit, you could always you know, fix one limb and fix the other. You just, you always continuously, next day you are monitoring the patient, you know, if they are better or slightly better, you could X-fix and until they stabilize even more. So just show them that you, you're monitoring the patient continuously and you know, don't just make one decision and stick to it. You'll have to change your decisions several times maybe before you reach a final uh, operation. Good. So um, now we will move on to the um, MCQ questions. There are three questions, if uh, Ruth can kindly share them. So, okay, guys, so as, as usual, um, these questions, uh, three questions, um, we'll give you a couple of minutes to answer.
I hope you can all see them. And uh, just to remind everyone, it's anonymized, so please yeah. do um, have a go at answering the questions. No one will be able to see your answers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for uh, that reminder, Ruth. Yeah, anonymize. So please, every single one of you attempt. It just gives you an idea of where you are um, um, in terms of your exam preparation. And, and it's very helpful for you to make sense of the answers afterwards. And um, Mr. Bates will take us through, through this um, in another minute. So please, um, I ask everyone to if anyone have any problem viewing these questions please uh, send us a message uh, once we're done with these questions um uh peter will have have um, a case discussion and there will be some more questions during the case discussion, which we have set up also. Is that correct, Ruth? Yeah? Yes, that's correct. So, so, so if everybody can attempt these questions, um, we'll wait until most people have answered them. And just a reminder, it is anonymous, so please do attempt them. Yeah, we have, at the moment, we have 191 participants. So it would be nice to have 191 and um, votes or answers. So case discussion after this, and then uh, will be Viva. The Viva session is not recorded, obviously, as, as usual. Um, and we have already picked the candidates um, for the Viva. So thanks everyone who raised their hand. And sorry if anyone didn't have the opportunity So three minutes now. We normally give you three minutes, but I think more of you are answering the questions. So we will give you a bit more time. Okay, so we have 80% um, answer rate at the moment. So should we end the board? Are you happy, Peter, to take, um, take us through these questions? Thank you. Um, Peter, hang on, I think you've unmuted yourself. You've muted <laughs> yourself, sorry. Yeah, okay. All right, Peter. Element. Um, so the um, uh, the top the top three are all definitions of major hem of massive hemorrhage, and the bottom one is just something made up. Basically, you calculate massive hemorrhage on how much blood you think they've lost, not on how many products you've given them. And that's why that last one is incorrect. Um, uh, next one is uh, twenty six year old guy. Um, uh, 
a rise in ED after an RTA, bleeding from open wound on the right calf. Um, so he's got, he, he's, he's shocked, isn't he? P24, blood pressure 83 over 50. He's got cold peripheries. He's got an, a right tibia fracture, uh, which is open, isn't it? Because he's bleeding from an open wound on his right calf. Um, Fema, multiple rib fractures. He's, he's pretty banged up, which is not a first line action. Pressure to the leg. He's, he's bleeding from his leg. What, what do we do with bleeding? We press on it, don't we? You can put tourniquets on in the field, but that is very much an out-of-hospital thing. If you've got a long way to come and someone has literally got an arterial bleeder that's hosing out and you haven't got someone to press on it. That's, that's you know, tourniquet is pretty niche, honestly. Uh, IV antibiotics, that is actually emergent care now. You know, new post guidelines, IV antibiotics need to get in there within within three hours, but ideally with it, you know, it's, it's going to be within an hour soon. So IV antibiotics, they, they, they're part of the emergent setting. Tranexamic, same, early, first hours, what those in. Uh, ABGs, everyone wants to know what that lactate is. That The ABG really tells you what their systemic state is. So that, that the anesthetist wants that straight away. Uh, and if, if they're shocked, that you are starting a massive transfusion protocol. Rotem, the reason why that is wrong is because actually Rotem is not a great thing for when a patient comes in. You don't care what their clotting is. You're about to throw pack A into them um, and you're gonna do that whatever happens. So whatever their clotting is at the start, doesn't really matter. You're gonna throw pack A into them and then after pack A's gone in, you'd like to know what their, um, what their uh, what, they're, what their clotting's doing. So Rotem is something you do like into the resuscitation, almost as phase two rather than at phase one. Uh, next one is um, uh, damage control orthopedics uh, uh, and systemic inflammatory response. So uh, what was the right answer there? Early to primitive mosquito, sorry, um, all of those are, are true except Early definitive mosquito fixation within 36 hours is strongly associated with a reduced uh, SIRS and ARDS. Um, this one, in polytrauma patients with chest injuries, damage control is usually preferred. That is not the case anymore. That used to be the case, but as I was saying in my talk, chest injuries now, if anything, a chest injury drives you to do, it, it drives you to do early appropriate care almost more forcefully. You wanna get in there quickly before their chest deteriorates. Um, because if you leave them and you don't do your damage control or you and you don't do your definitive nailing, but you do damage control, what you end up happening with is a patient who now has a really bad chest and they have a broken femur, which you're not sure what to do with. So uh, chest injuries almost drive early appropriate care more than they, they do previously. And that's why uh, that middle one, uh, 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 patients with chest injuries, is, is the incorrect answer. Sorry, I got a bit muddled there. No, you know you're correct. It's a bit confusing the way they it's set up. It's set up, here, yeah, yeah, because that that's just the most commonly answered question. Yeah, I, I, I thought red was that was the correct answer because in all the other two, that people have got the correct answer. Right? Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah. great, thanks. Good. So, um, thank you, guys. Thank you, Peter, for explaining. And um, we mo can move. Can we move on now, please, to the case discussion? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. We are ready. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, Peter, just to let you know, I've set up um, the two MCQ polls. So just let me know when you want me to run those questions to the audience during this. Oh, you set them up? I oh, have. I've yeah. managed to. So just give me the heads up and I'll run them. Okay, great. All right, lovely. Okay. I'll so run one at a time. So. Am I still screen sharing? You still see my screen? Yes, yes we can see your screen. Yeah. Lovely, lovely. Okay. So um, this is the case. This is the case. Um, we've got a 42 year old male, most likely you can read it all, it's right there. Um, he's, he's found a long way from his bite. It's obviously a big injury and he's got a whole load of injuries. I want you just, just, to, just to read those and just get your head around them. Um, he had an RSI, rapid sequence induction at the scene because he was combative. Um, and so obviously, uh, he's got a bit of a, he's got a bit of a head injury and he was a bit shocked. So they, they, so he's intubated and ventilated. Um, there's bleeding from the groin, from the groin wound at the seam, but that has now stopped. So it's, it, he's got this big groin. I'll show you his groin wound in just a second. 
Uh, and he's in ED now, and his hemodynamics are improving with PAC A. So actually, those figures that I'm showing you there were the second lot. The first lot was somewhat worse than that. Okay, so he has improved a little bit with PAC A. All right, here's his stuff. So that on the on the left of your screen, this is a different patient I got off, I got off the internet because I haven't got a picture of this guy's groin laceration, but that's exactly what it looked like. His leg is, this is his leg here. This is his ball bag there, which has been pulled over to the left side and uh, to his left side. And here, here it is, you can see it's been stuffed with some packs and it's a big groin laceration. If you were to poke your finger in there, your finger will be straight down onto his pelvic bone and, and there's, a, there's a fracture underneath. I haven't got a picture of the pelvic fracture uh, that's his open tibia, the wound's about that long, about two or three centimetres. Those are his x-rays. He's got his, his left femur and his right uh, 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 tibia. So right femur, left tibia. I've got those wrong way around, haven't I? That, that it's, it's the other way around. Right, um, uh, so left femur, right tibia. Tibia is open, femur is closed, and that's his groin laceration, which was bleeding heavily at the scene but is not bleeding anymore, all right? He's also got a head injury and he's got some maxillofacial trauma. So, first question, Ruth, over to you. Okay, one second. Brace yourselves. So I think the best way for this to work out is if someone just puts their hand up and, and volunteers to just talk about what, what they, they think is, is, uh, is, is the probably the, their best choice answer. Um, it's 6 p.m. This guy comes in at 6 p.m. When does this patient need to go to theatre? All right. Uh, uh, okay, oh, guys are doing a poll. Okay, fine. Yeah, do a poll. I'll give him just a couple of minutes just to answer the poll. Well, not that long, but just a quick Yeah, no, let, let the poll go. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to wait till all 181 are done. <laughs> but uh, let's, let's see what people are preferring. Okay. So we've got a few right nows. We, uh, people are liking to wait until the lactate is down and then go. Okay, great. Um, okay, just pretty, another uh, 20 seconds and I'll close it. Not right now, but within a few hours. Okay, right, so I'm loving that you guys are waiting for the lactate to come down and then go. And that, that is actually not an unreasonable situation. The truth is, this will become a bit of a theme, all of these are perfectly reasonable strategies as long as you're as long as your rationale is correct. It's okay to take this patient to theatre right now. That's perfectly okay. If you've got a theatre, take them upstairs. That's absolutely fine. What's the downside of taking them to, to theatre right now? What's the downside of that? Well, the downside is that you work, their lactate is still quite high. And even if you take them to, to theatre right now, but or within a few hours of now, if the lactate is still a little bit high, there's only so much you can do to the patient. You can wash their wounds out and you could change those packs and wash it all out and put some more packs in. And maybe you could put some X fixes on. So for the right now people and the not right now, but within a few hours people, that's not incorrect. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But if you do that, you're not doing definitive treatment of any of the fractures. Notice how the weird thing is you could take this patient to theater right now. You could put, um, you could put an X fix on the femur you could put an X fix on, on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the femur and indeed on the tibia. And then you could bring them back to, and then go back to the ITU. They could then come back again into the uh, to theatre within 36 hours, have all those X fixes taken off and have, it, and have uh, femoral nails put up. Have a femoral nail put up, have the pelvis fixed, and uh, if they had a spine injury, they could have the spine done. So it could still be early appropriate care and yet, you either put traction on, you put X fixes on. You with me? So just because something's early appropriate care doesn't mean it has to happen tonight. It can still happen tomorrow and still be early appropriate care. Tomorrow morning will be fine. Not many of you are liking that, but actually at the Royal London Hospital, that's often what happens. Patients come in like this and they end up, and we see them at six, we go, okay, let's resus them overnight, leave the binder on, and tomorrow we'll line them up to have all this fixed up because he's not traumatically bleeding. Within the next 24 hours, agree, well, 
probably that's the only one that I would I probably would go against just because he's got a big open wound in his in his and and so the latest boast guidelines for open fractures is that they should ideally be going to theatre within 12 hours and so choosing something that's 24 is a little bit outside of your boast guidelines on that one for open fractures so I probably wouldn't have gone with that one wait until lactates down there and then go that's fine also but only up to a point. So the, the, the red guy is the most common. That's totally fine. And that's actually the same as tomorrow morning will be fine. Those two are basically the same thing. Because tomorrow morning, the lactate will be down. And then you're fine to go and do early definitive. So my preferred answers for, for me are tomorrow AVM will be fine. Or wait till the lactate comes down. Um, but the, the right now people are not wrong. You're just going down a slightly more aggressive uh, damage control route, uh, but you can still do early appropriate care even if you put them on traction. So that's my take on that one. Try the, uh, try the next one. Okay, I'm just gonna leave that up. The patient goes to theater for non-orthopedic reasons. So that's either a, a, a bolt get put in their head or they had they, the, the general surgeons decided they want to do a laparotomy for whatever reason, um, or they had an ischemic leg. Something happened that was not orthopedic, which forced the patient to go. So they're now in theatre that night. What are you going to do? They're in theatre and they're saying, "Come on, Mr. Orthopod, what do you want to do?" Haha. <laughs> I love it that you're all split. It's great. Just let this pan out. But usually, uh, usually the proportions don't change that much as we go. And again, uh, 100 people have voted. I'm going to crack on. Again, the funny thing about it is, is all of those are perfectly reasonable strategies as long as you you have a reason for doing it. So, we what. What is the common theme with all those four options? What's the common theme? Number one is wound washout comes first, okay? Wound care. In polytrauma, you can fix bones and stuff, and that's great. And you can put X-fixes on, and that's great. But one thing, you do not want to go back to the, to the, think about it, if this patient gets sick, and I just have to come off table right now, let's say they have a heart attack or something on table, I have to stop. And I, I have down tools and I've no more orthopedic treatment to do. What do I not want them going back to the intensive care unit having not done? Do you see what I mean? What, what's the thing I don't want to leave undone when they go back? And one thing which is a real nuisance if you don't deal with it now is wound care. If patients have underbrided wounds, they will fester and turn septic and, and it's all downhill. So wound traumatic wounds need to be a priority within that first visit to theatre. So in all of those options, you'll notice I put wound washout as the first thing because that is the, that's the right thing to do. Okay. Um, you could put traction on, put a binder on. If they're human, a binder is perfectly reasonable. So even if you go to theatres, you don't have to put an X-fix on. You can still leave that, wash out the wound, put a binder back on, and then, and then come out. That is a, or you could leave the binder off and just put it back on if they're hemodynamically unstable. Just because they've got a pelvic fracture doesn't mean they have to have a binder. Remember, pelvic binders are hemostatic agents. They're for stopping hemorrhage. They're not for, um, they're not for, um, uh, uh, making an x-ray look good or reducing a pelvic fracture, they're there to stop bleeding. Wound washout, x-fix uh, pelvis and x-fix femur. Again, totally reasonable. As long as you're debriding the wounds, you can then x-fix everything else and come back another day. This patient may still be good for early appropriate care, as I said earlier on. Uh, wound washout, then recheck the lactate. Yeah, absolutely. Very reasonable. You've been really aggressive to take the theatre. You could wash out all the wounds and then see how they're doing. They might have been resuscitated enough. Lactate's now down at 2.8. In which case, why not nail the femur? They're in theatre. Go for it, man. Do it. Finally, wound wash out, exfix uh, pelvis, skeletal traction of the femur. Again, perfectly reasonable. Um, uh, you, you can exfixes in my head. Exfixes and skeletal traction are interchangeable in that early stage in that early bit where you're trying to just, you're just temporizing patients, waiting for them to resuscitate properly. 
All right. So actually, none of those are wrong. All of those you can argue very, very reasonably, provided you're taking care of their wounds at the first theatre visit. Okay, great. Uh, I think that's it, isn't it? I think that's, that's our poll done. That's done, yeah. So, yes. Great. I'm going to go back to this guy now. Um, so there he is. What are we going to do? Uh, and what are we going to do with this guy? How do we make sense of all this stuff that's going on? And there's, it's more complicated than this because going to be, there's going to be figures, there's going to be blood gases, there's going to be HBs, there's going to be other people coming in with information. So how do we make sense of what this patient needs? And here's how I rationalise it. Obviously, polytrauma is more complicated than this, and I'm not pretending it's all very, very straightforward. But here's how I rationalise this. Sorry. This needs resuscitation. And I think we'd all agree with that. He still needs resuscitation. He's still acidotic. Therefore, resuscitation needs to happen. These guys need wound care. All right. And we've talked about wound care. These three need their bones stabilizing. Yeah, the femur needs a femoral nail. Tibia needs a tibial nail. Or it may be an X fix because it's open, depending on how you want to play it. And, 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 the, and the pelvis needs fixing as well. And finally, you've got max fax, and you've got a head injury, and you've got your open tibia. And those need communication with other specialties. Notice I've left open tibia with comms, because that needs more than plastics. It needs also, it needs plastics as well, yeah? So whenever you see an open fracture, do not forget to see the, say the word plastic surgeons, yeah? And it should nowadays, it's plastics consultant, it's senior plastic surgeon post-CCT uh, plastic surgeon, all right? So, and how do, you, how do you order those? Pretty much in the order I've done them. Resuscitation comes first, absolutely comes first. Then you wanna know what other guys are planning, right? You wanna know what, the, what, the head, what, what they're doing about the head injury. What are you doing about the max facts? What do you wanna do about these things? Communication is the next thing down. Talk to your colleagues, what are you up to? Talk to the anesthetist, what are you up to? How bad is the patient? How, what's the systemic situation, et cetera? When you, if you're going to go to theatre, the next priority is definitely wound care. And then at the bottom of it is stabilised bones. All right? So in, as a basic rule of principle, that is your order of service of polytrauma. Resuscitate, communicate, wound care, stabilised bones. And stabilising bones, of course, can be definitive or temporising. And definitive is, is like a... Um, Definitive is like, you know, like, like, a, like a femoral nail and temporizing is, 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 a, is an X-fix or a skeletal traction. And that's exactly what we did. We discussed it with colleagues. I discussed the, the case and we gave it some time. We wait, you know what we did? We waited till morning. <laughs> we waited till morning. And sure enough, when we got to the morning, the lactate was now down at 2.8. The ICP was, was, was actually down, as, was not too bad. Uh, uh, we gave it some time. And... And now it's time for wound care. It's 10 hours. It's time to get in there and do something now because the lactate's down and we can move. So we go to theatre. Uh, the lactate, the whole, nothing ch changes very much. And we decided, I decided because it was, um, uh, it, just, it was the easiest thing to do. The tibia was wobbling around. We debrided the wound. Uh, the lactate was good. And so I thought I would, I would, I would nail the tibia. So we did that. So we did a, a, did a, a tibial, tibial nail. Um, the, the femur and tibia were actually on the same side. Um, uh, we then, then did a retrograde femoral nail uh, and that was all good. Uh, and and patient, patient ends up doing well, uh, recovered well, all good. Uh, the, actually, it turned out that the laceration on, on the pelvis was, was nothing too serious. Uh, and actually it was an LC1, which, didn't, which, which just needed an SI screw. And, we, and we, we did that a few days later. Um, and we, we, we closed up all the wounds at the same time. So what I've given you there is quite a nice, soft, easy polytrauma. Yeah, nice, nothing too difficult, nothing too complicated. But what happens with polytrauma, so that was a, that's a true case. Now, you're going to be thinking, yeah, but what if? Yeah, but yeah, 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 okay, that's, that's that. But what if, for example, there was a big chest injury? What if there was a major head injury? What if, if that subarachnoid, what if the ICP had been 23, not 13? What if there had been 
blood pouring out of that guy's uh, pelvis, like pouring out. And you pack it and pack it, and it's leaking around the packs, and he's hemodynamically unstable, and still he's packing. You know, what would you do in that situation? How does that change what you would do here? So let's walk through those. Okay, patient's got a big chest injury. Um, what would that, what, how would that change what I did? Honestly, that wouldn't change that situation. I would do exactly the same. It wouldn't, it wouldn't come into the reckoning. Now, what it might do, if he's got a really bad chest injury, is it might keep, make the lactate a little bit higher or harder to get down, in which case that, yes, if the lactate stays high, then you do have that drives you towards some kind of damage control situation. But if you can get the lactate down, the, the chest injury in my head doesn't actually come into it. It is relevant, but it doesn't come into your orthopedic decision making. Okay, so that's, that's chest injury. And that goes back to that MCQ we had earlier on. And is there evidence for that? Yes, there is. Valier dealt with this in her article, in her articles. Valier's dealt with this and she said, you know, um, uh, uh, she looked at ch a chest injury and, and leaving it, leaving a chest injury with damage control was worse than, or, or, than, than, than early, early appropriate care with, with a chest injury. Um, and we know, we know how chest injuries can deteriorate, right? So this is a, a little old lady who stopped, that's her x-ray to begin with. And then literally two days later, two days later, sorry, sorry, man. That's her x-ray when she comes in, that's her x-ray two days later. She now you can see she's on CPAP. Uh, and so she ends up getting getting uh, getting uh, uh, a, a chest fix. Now I'm not saying I'm not saying not claiming that rib fractures are are things that need to be fixed immediately. What I'm saying is that chest injuries are relevant, but not to your immediate uh, orthopedic decision making at the moment. And that evidence may change. Next, uh, what if there's a major what if there's a major bleed, a major head injury? Well, that often drives you towards that damage control. So if, if I knew that this patient's ICP was 25 or 36 or something, I would actually put X fixes on, it, on, that, on that femur because I know that patient's not coming back to the theater for at least, uh, at least three or four days. Uh, I'd either put on skeletal traction or a, an X fix. Major bleeding. Major bleeding needs controlling. So you've got to control the bleed. You're still in C. You're not, you, you haven't even got to uh, communication yet. You're still in resuscitation. You're still level one. You've got to pack it. You've got to embolize it. You've got to do whatever is required to stop that bleeding. And that, that may require general surgical access. And so you need your, your trauma guys there. All right. So, so other things do change the context. But ultimately, orthopedic decision making is one, two, three, four in my head. Um, so... Um, Wound, wound care, uh, so, so, uh, when you do your surgery, speed is, is, is actually quite important. Uh, familiarity is also important, and having two teams can be really helpful when you're dealing with polytrauma. When I say spade, I don't mean you're trying to rush the operation. I'm just saying that getting operations done reasonably quickly, not spending four hours over a femoral nail, really does help the patient. So doing a femoral nail quickly is important, and familiarity with that, obviously, those two are linked. And having two teams, so someone's fixing the forearm while somebody else is doing a retrograde femoral nail is really, really helpful too. Um, and keeping an eye on the lactate intra-op. So if you're doing some major surgery on someone, warn the anesthetist. If the lactate keeps creeping up, it starts creeping up, please tell me and I will stop. And I'll just put them in traction. Okay? Great. So prioritization in summary, is resuscitation, communication, surgical decision-making about whether you get to ITU, angio, or theater. That's in the ED. And then you don't have to go to theater now. You can do, but it limits your options a bit. But you, but you, uh, but you don't have to. Wound care at the first visit. And there are different flavors of DCO. DCO can be put someone in traction for now and then fix them uh, and then take them back to theater in 24, 48 hours. You're still within that early appropriate care window. And uh, for definitive treatment, think about doing surgeries briskly so that they, you know, they, they, they happens and it gets done and the patient's off table and keeping on their lactate while you do it. 